from Kansas State University. This is Agriculture Today. Eric Atkinson here. And coming up today with this week's cattle market commentary out of Oklahoma State University, Daryl Peel. Among other things, he'll look at the current trends in cattle slaughter and how cow and heifer slaughter in particular might influence the numbers in the next USDA cattle inventory report. Also today, Sarah Moyer talks with K-State's Janelle Coons about the 2019 Women Managing the Farm Conference. Co-sponsored by K-State, they'll cover the speaker lineup and the conference sessions that will take place at this highly popular event. And later on, Jeff Wickman with this week's 4-H segment. He'll visit with K-State's Daryl Waldron about adult volunteer training for the 4-H Dog Project. All that and more straight ahead on Agriculture Today. Hamburgers, roast, ribs, steak, or whatever you prefer. Beef, it's what's for dinner. Kansas cattle farmers produce 7.5 million head of cattle per year. It takes about 7 tablespoons of peanut butter to get the same amount of protein in one serving of lean beef. Support your local Kansas farmers and ranchers. Eat beef. This message was brought to you by the K-State Animal Sciences Leadership Academy participants. You're tuned in to the K-State Radio Network. Thanks for joining us once more for Agriculture Today. Thoughts and input on the cattle markets now from our guest out of Stillwater, Oklahoma, Daryl Peel, along via phone. Daryl, of course, a livestock economist at Oklahoma State University. Uh, quite an assortment of things we'll get into today, Daryl, but we'll begin with the cash fed cattle trade last week retreated a couple of dollars. This market just can't get a whole lot of momentum going, it doesn't seem. <laughs> well, it it did pull back a little bit, both uh, fed cattle and boxed beef a little bit, and I, you know, I, I think that's probably just kind of the short run timing here. As we get into the holiday season, we'll see, you know, fits of of buying and demand, and then uh, pull back from that a little bit. But in general, I think we're probably going to hold some reasonably good levels here for the remainder of the year. So there's really no worry about a, a precipitous drop in this market. It's just the ebb and flow, a few dollars here and there every week, it seems. I think so. Uh, you know, again, it's uh, it, it's kind of a uh, up and down time, if you will, when we get into this holiday period and there's, uh, you know, pronounced buying uh, for holiday specialing and then that passes and, and we see that. But, you know, this market has strengthened a little bit from the earlier lows and I think it'll probably maintain these as we go forward here through, uh, through the re- remainder of the year. You mentioned box beef sort of pairing back as well, but we do typically see beef demand slow a bit because of the holidays coming up at this point of the year, don't we? Well, it's a it's a bit of a mixed bag. I mean, overall, we think of this not being a strong beef demand time, although, you know, when we think about even Christmas, but certainly New Year's, it's a strong demand time for things like prime rib. And, and we've certainly seen that demand. The middle meats have actually carried uh, the boxed beef higher here through the fall, and I think it's it's related to that. But, you know, we also typically actually see seasonally higher box beef prices this time of the year, and that's more a function of the seasonal supply tendency. So we, we tighten up supplies a little bit, and even though demand is not necessarily stronger this time of the year, overall, the supplies uh, tend to hold the uh, prices a little bit higher in the fourth quarter. On the feeder cattle side, really pretty slow going as far as volume is concerned right now. Well, yeah, again, it's been an up and down fall, uh, at least in Oklahoma, with the, uh, you know, weather conditions. We've, uh, you know, we're trying to get lots of wheat pasture to come on, but we've had very wet conditions that have actually delayed turnout. Uh, but, you know, that said, we are now moving into our uh, our biggest uh, numbers of the year for the run. Uh, they Again, those were kind of up and down over the past few weeks, but this past week in Oklahoma was the highest uh, weekly volume we've seen in auctions uh, so far this year. I wouldn't be surprised surprised if this week uh, actually puts in uh, the seasonal peak in, in our overall auction volume. Is that being driven by wheat pasture demand then or something else? 
Well, I th- you know, it's the time of year when there's a lot of cattle for sale, and, and the, the question then is, do we have enough demand to hold these prices steady? And, and we really do. Um, you know, again, it's it's been an unusual challenge as far as wheat pasture goes this year. Uh, normally, we're trying to get enough wheat pasture to be able to put cattle out on wheat. Uh, this year, we got at least a, a bunch of the wheat was planted early and is, uh, is ready to graze, but it's been so wet we've had to delay turnout. So it's been a, a different kind of challenge this year, but overall there's a lot of demand. We're going to have a lot of wheat pasture, and I think that's keeping demand. Uh, maybe some producers are actually going to wind up buying a, a few more cattle than they originally planned because we will have lots of wheat pasture. And uh, the profitability prospects for grazing wheat uh, seem to be pretty good right now. They've still held up pretty well. If you look at uh, you know prices this fall relative to the board, of course the board's been pretty volatile too. If you look at those uh, you know March feeder futures uh, for dual purpose wheat, yeah, they've been somewhat volatile. So it depends a little on the day, but overall we've held levels that would suggest uh, you know some decent return to both the cattle and and the wheat pasture. Well, Darrell, let's get into a few things that you've been tracking closely here in these markets, and one being the trends in cattle slaughter. And you'd like to break this down by class of animal and examine those independently. You know, there, there's a very different story. Uh, I mean, we can look at overall cattle slaughter. It's up about 2.7% for the year to date. Uh, and that's about, you know, what it'll stay here on a year-over-year basis as we finish out the year. But when you look at the different classes, you get very different stories. Steer slaughter has been one of the harder things to get a handle on this year. You know, for the year to date, steer slaughter is still running almost 1% below a year ago. And this despite the fact that the quarterly uh, feedlot inventory numbers uh, confirm that we've got more steers in feedlots than we've had, and we have had for the last several quarters. So it's been a little hard to figure out when those steers are going to show up in the slaughter mix. Uh, I think we'll close the gap a little bit here in the last few weeks of the year. Heifer slaughter um, has been running, you know, significantly above year-ago levels, although here late in the year we're pulling that year-to-date increase down a little bit. We're currently at about 7% up from a year ago. Beef cow slaughter also is pulled down just a little bit, but it's still running 10 to 11 percent above year ago levels. And that's really just getting uh, beef cow slaughter back up to normal culling rates when you look at it as a percent of the overall herd. The last piece, of course, is dairy cow slaughter. Um, you know, the dairy industry has struggled with really poor economics for many months now, and, and, and it has finally turned into some, uh, you know, some response in the industry to pull these uh, cow numbers down. So we've seen a little bit uh, of increase in this dairy cow slaughter. So you put it all together with, you know, the slaughter stuff, we're going to see an increase in slaughter, but uh, sort of different things happening across the board in, in the different sectors. If you take a couple of those categories, specifically cow and heifer slaughter, both are up from last year. Uh, that could lend to some thoughts as to where the size of the herd is headed as we'll get into 2019. And uh, in the latter part of January 19, we will have the latest uh, cattle inventory report. So will the current slaughter trends uh, for females, cows and heifers be reflected there? I think so. You know, we watch these slaughter numbers through the year until we get our, you know, uh, annual numbers uh, to confirm what has happened to the herd inventory. But when you look at this heifer slaughter number and the cow slaughter number taken together, they they seem to confirm that we are really slowing down herd expansion. I believe the numbers will ultimately show that we did expand the herd slightly, the beef cow herd specifically, in 2018, probably something between uh, zero and one percent. So, you know, maybe a half a percent to increase. You know, these these cow slaughter numbers, as I said, really reflect sort of normal culling rates. And actually, the heifer slaughter, if you look at it as a percent of total slaughter, is just now returning to a more normal level after having been so low while we were holding a lot of heifers. So, you know, to me, this just uh, the slaughter numbers seem to suggest that we're uh, sort of peaking out this herd size, growing slowly in 2018, and, and, you know, 2019 might be the peak. And we need to add one more element to this discussion, and that is uh, the rise in carcass weights. And uh, that could then parlay into what we'd expect for, you say, total beef production rounding out this year and into 2019. 
That's right. You know, we, we know that uh, we just talked about the fact that slaughter is up, um, at least in total across the board. Uh, so we watch these carcass weights pretty carefully to see uh, what's going to happen. If you remember in 2017, we had a sharp increase in cattle slaughter, but a significant decrease year over year in carcass weights, which offset some of that and moderated the increase in beef production. It was still up, but not as much up because of lower carcass weights. In 2018 here, we've been watching these carcass weights. They are up. Uh, steers are up about four pounds on a year to date basis on average over last year. Heifers are up stronger, about eight pounds heavier than a year ago. Uh, but when you put it all together, cow carcass weights are also up a little bit because there's more dairy cows in the mix. So, um, you know, we're, we're adding two to three pounds uh, additional carcass weight plus uh, nearly three percent more slaughter. All of that contributes to the fact that we're going to see about 27 billion pounds of beef uh, produced in 2018. That's a new record. And, you know, we're going to see slight increases in slaughter again in 2019 and probably slight increases in these carcass weights. So we're going to see another new record. Uh, we're, we're projecting at this point about 27.5 billion pounds of beef produced in 2019. Wow. So those numbers sound rather daunting, and that once again puts the onus back on beef demand keeping up with that pace of beef production and uh, whether or not there'll be uh, things to impede that demand is the question at hand, Daryl. It really is. We've focused on this for quite a few months now. Demand has been the key. Demand has been, uh, you know, very favorable and has helped us in, you know, really going back to 2017 all through 2018 here. Going forward, as long as we continue, you know, I, I sort of describe it as so far so good. That said, there's a number of things that we really need to keep an eye on, and there's some chance that we could see some bigger impacts going forward. The longer we continue this trade war stuff and tariffs stay in place, the more likelihood that those impacts are going to catch up with us a little bit, particularly as we get into more, uh, if we were to ramp up, you know, tariffs on Chinese goods again, those are largely directed at consumer products at this point. And so at some point, uh, that could begin to impact consumer demand here in the U.S. And, you know, when you add record beef production to record pork and poultry production, both this year and again next year, uh, we've got lots of challenges. So there's reasons to be concerned and to pay attention to that. But uh, at this point in time, it's it's been okay so far. So, you know, again, so far, so good. Very good. We always appreciate your input, Daryl, and we will catch up with you again in a few weeks. Many thanks to you. You bet. That's Daryl Peel, a livestock economist at Oklahoma State University, and we bring in Daryl for his remarks on the cattle trading trends regularly here on Agriculture Today. After this break, we'll hand it on over to Sarah Moyer and her guest as they'll look ahead to what has become, over the years, a quite high-profile conference for women in agriculture that'll take place early next year right here in Manhattan. More on that in a moment. This is the K-State Radio Network. What is radon? Home exposure to radon gas is the leading cause of lung cancer death in the United States for non-smokers. In Kansas, one in four homes will test at or above the EPA action level. The Surgeon General recommends all homes be tested and fixed if necessary. Visit kansasradonprogram.org for more information. Test. Fix. Save a life. This message brought to you by the Kansas Radon Program, the Kansas Association of Broadcasters, and this station. Welcome back to Agriculture Today. I'm Sarah Moyer. The Women Managing the Farm Conference will host farmers, rural business leaders, and landowners February of next year for developing skills and giving women resources to help them manage the farm. Here to talk about it today, we have Planning Committee member Janelle Coons. Janelle, it's good to have you on here today. Yes, thank you for having me. Yeah, we have seen it in Manhattan for the past several years, but we've got our roots down in Wichita as part of a grant-funded program. So we have moved around a little bit, but now we're here in Manhattan for the foreseeable future. And would you like to talk about the audience with this conference? Who comes to the Women Managing the Farm Conference? Well, really anyone who is involved with agriculture can attend this conference. We'll see farmers and ranchers, of course. We'll see absentee landowners. We'll see people that work with industry. Also, uh, maybe lenders might come. Really anyone who 
works day to day with agriculture is invited to attend this conference and we have educational sessions that really meet all of those needs. There are a number of sessions and presentations to choose from, and then, of course, some general sessions as well. The date that's been set for this upcoming conference is February 7th and 8th. That's a Thursday and Friday. So it seems like a little ways off, but there are some registration deadlines that we'll talk about later that people can take advantage of a little earlier Mm -hmm. if they're thinking ahead. Let's go ahead and talk about why someone wants to attend the Women Managing the Farm Conference. What's the draw in there for different people? Well, a lot of reasons we see for women attending is there might be a certain topic area that they're interested in learning more about. It might be farm finances or maybe a production element of their farm that they're considering. So we'll see a lot of that. But it's also we see women coming just for the networking opportunities. They may be managing the farm on their own or maybe recently had a spouse pass away or they may be an absentee landowner. And we'll see a lot of those women come and they'll connect. Actually, I'm remembering last year we had a few farm wives come and they were younger and they were actually from out of state and they married a Kansas farmer rancher. And so they were really kind of diving into what it means to be a producer's spouse. Let's talk about some of the specific topics that will be going on with general session presenters. That applies to everybody. What do you look forward to with the general session presenters at this year's conference? Well, yes, I'm really looking forward to having a couple of ag economists on the agenda for that. We have Jason Lusk. He is the department chair and a professor with Purdue University in the ag economics department. And we also have Michael Taylor here from Kansas State University, and she's worked with Extension a lot and just delivering different messages about land leasing, rental rates, commodity markets, different things like that. So we're excited to have those economists with us. And another speaker I'm pretty excited about, I've heard Stacy Seibel once before. She's an attorney out of Hayes, Kansas, and her main specialty out there is estate planning law. And we usually hear that a lot in our breakout sessions. We'll have speakers do that, but we're excited to have that as a main session because that's something our participants are really interested in. So Ms. Seibel is really familiar with estate planning. She's a fifth generation coming from a line of farmers and ranchers, and she just wants to make it her mission so that people can pass on their assets to the next generation and avoid some of those taxes and other things. And then I'm also really excited about we have someone that's coming from the Northeast, so a little bit out of our region here. We have Amanda Friend, and she helps with her family farm in East Canaan, Connecticut, And that farm has three businesses to it. They are a dairy farm. They also have a farm market and bakery. And they have a value-added product called cow pots, which is a biodegradable pot that they make out of their cow's manure. So I'm really excited to hear from her and the different roles that she has to help manage their farm. And she's also very involved in some other ag organizations. So just to talk about her involvement with those. So many ways to get excited about this conference, and you mentioned just moments ago about some of the breakout sessions, and so what are some of those topics? Those topics, again, they just vary. We'll also kind of have some more fun or personal topics that will be available, also some gun health and different things like that. Those aren't all outlined yet, but if we keep watching our website, they're going to be popping up from day to day. That website is womenmanagingthefarm.com. You can also like their Facebook page, Women Managing the Farm, for continuing updates. And, of course, you want those to be current for the women attending, correct? Yes. Yeah, we'll keep that Facebook page up to date so it'll keep having announcements about breakout sessions and speakers. And one thing I do want to mention, just before the conference starts on February 6th, that we do have some pre-conference tracks that really help um, women that are interested delve a little bit deeper into certain topics. Those include, we're having a QuickBooks, and we're having two tracks for those. We're having an intro to QuickBooks and then an 
advanced QuickBooks. So really kind of whatever your level is with QuickBooks, you can get in on one of those. They'll have laptops available. And what I really like about them is they have some like hands-on scenarios that you can work through um, and just kind of manage the books for those scenarios. So that's really important to kind of learn those processes, I think. And then our other pre-conference tracks are, we're teaming up with Highland Community College, um, their Wamigo location, which is just down the road from Manhattan. And they're going to have some sessions about grape production and winemaking. So if you're interested in a little bit of a wine tasting, they will have that available, but they'll also give a tour of the vineyard and show everyone the winemaking process and some of the varieties that they produce. And then we're also looking at their precision ag technology program at Highland Community College And they'll kind of give you a tour of the classroom and some of the different systems that are merging with technology and agriculture. So multiple educational institutions involved. Of course, there's some industry sponsors involved. And exciting to know that there are these optional pre-conference workshops for those who want just a little extra professional development or a little extra learning as they are visiting Manhattan for the 2019 conference. Let's go ahead and talk about registration, Janelle. There are a couple different deadlines, and you have the information as to how to sign up. Yes, um, registration can be done a couple different ways. You can go on our website, or you can register by phone, and that's 1-800-432-8222. And if you go ahead and register soon, before December 14th, it's going to be $140. And if you're not able to register by then, you can register up until January 25th for the $160 rate. So it's a great way to, you know, you could go with friends, maybe friends from one of your ag associations. Um, Maybe you have a business partner you work with. So it also makes a good gift for the holidays, we like to say. So maybe a spouse might want to get that for his wife or something like that. But we also have scholarships available. So we know that farm finances are tight right now. So there is a scholarship opportunity. It's a short application with a brief essay. And those are available online under our registration page. So once again, the phone number Janelle mentioned is 800-432-8222. And, of course, the website, womenmanagingthefarm.com, has both the registration information and the scholarship information, two ways there for the Women Managing the Farm Conference. Again, the dates are February 7th and 8th, and it will be in Manhattan, Kansas. Any other comments or encouragements for listeners, Janelle? I just like to encourage people to go out on our website and look at the resources we have out there as well. We do post things on Facebook or the website throughout the year, videos about women farmers and ranchers here in Kansas. So I encourage you to go out and take a look at that. And if you have any questions for us, please get in touch. So even if you can't make the conference, there's still resources available that they want to have people able to reach. So thank you for coming on, Janelle, and speaking with us today. Thank you very much. That was Janelle Coons, a planning committee member for the 2019 Women Managing the Farm Conference here in Manhattan, Kansas. Those registration deadlines are the early bird registration on December 14th at the cost of $140. Regular registration is December 15th through January 25th at $160, and late registration after January 25th is $190. Those pre-conference workshops do come at an additional cost, just $25 for each session. Those QuickBooks sessions, Advanced and Introductory, and then the Viticulture and Farm Technology workshops at Highland Community College are each an additional $25. So you can choose from those going on on Wednesday, February 6th, the day before the conference kicks off. I'm Sarah Moyer, and we'll have more here on Agriculture Today.
While many people know hunger is an issue in developing countries, it is also a problem in our own backyards. In 2010, one in seven Kansans struggled to put adequate food on the table. Two K-State research and extension programs are tackling this problem. The Family Nutrition Program and Expanded Food and Nutrition Education Program reach thousands of Kansans and more than 70 counties. They learn how to eat healthy with a low budget. For more information about these programs, visit ksre.ksu.edu. You're tuned in to Agriculture Today, coming to you from the campus of Kansas State University. Eric Atkinson here, and now we'll check on today's agricultural news headlines for you, courtesy in part of DTN. Attempts to resolve the trade war between the U.S. and China are expected ahead of the planned meeting between President Trump and Chinese President Xi Jinping at that G20 summit in Argentina at the end of November. This confirmed by U.S. Ambassador to China Terry Branstad. Xi said last week that China wants to resolve problems through talks, but that the U.S. must respect Beijing's choice of development, path, and interests. Regarding U.S.-China trade issues, USDA Secretary Sonny Perdue issued a statement saying he expressed optimism that the president's approach to trade will lead to a resolution of the dispute with China. Meantime, a Trump administration source informs that the goal is to have a major U.S.-China agreement in place or a framework agreement in principle by the end of January 2019. Meanwhile, Mexico and Canada say that both want to resolve issues around U.S. tariffs on steel and other metals and on lifting their countermeasures on U.S. products, including several farm goods, pork, dairy, and so forth. Canada responded to the U.S. steel tariffs with retaliatory duties on about $12.6 billion worth of American imports, including food and beverage items. Canada doesn't like quotas as the talks continue, with Canada stressing they have taken measures to control the flow of international steel via Canada into North America. Meantime, Mexico's economy minister, Aldefonso Guajardo, notes that U.S.-Mexico trade adds up to more than $500 billion, while the tariffs between the countries hit only about $3 billion in goods in each country. He says it's not desirable to sign an agreement without considering the tariffs, but said that they would go ahead with signing the deal with Mexico, given the importance of the trading relationship. The Environmental Protection Agency timeline to finalize a rule for ethanol-blended gasoline before next summer is going to be a tight one. Here's more from the USDA's Stephanie Ho. Ag Secretary Sonny Perdue already has welcomed President Trump's announcement last month that his administration is seeking to expand the sale of corn ethanol. This is great news, obviously, for America, for American energy independence, for consumer choice and certainly good for agriculture and our corn farmers out there. The president's announcement a couple weeks ago that he's directing EPA to get started here was a very important signal. But, you know, the next step is seeing the actual proposal, digesting how EPA is proposing to make this fix. That was Jeff Cooper from Ethanol Trade Industry Group, the Renewable Fuels Association. EPA has indicated that February is when we should expect to see a proposal. Obviously, a final rule would need to be done no later than the end of May in order to have an impact on next summer's driving season. So that is a very short window and a very tight time frame and doesn't give EPA a whole lot of wiggle room to get this done. This is Stephanie Ho for the U.S. Department of Agriculture in Washington, D.C. And the Keystone XL Pipeline project hit yet another snag as a federal court in Montana late last week overturned the Trump administration's approval of a permit to build the pipeline. The U.S. District Court for the District of Montana Great Falls Division vacated the approval and remanded it back to the U.S. Department of State for a more thorough environmental review that could take months to complete. Environmental groups and numerous farmers and ranchers fought TransCanada, the company that wants to build the pipeline for years to stop construction of the 2,000-mile pipeline that would carry barrels of oil per day, 830,000 worth, from Alberta, Canada to the Gulf of Mexico. Opponents' concerns was the pipeline would pass through sensitive
sensitive habitats across the Nebraska Sandhills, and they feared any pipeline breaches could harm the environment. Also, TransCanada planned to use eminent domain with about 2% of landowners to acquire the land needed to build the pipeline, upsetting those who potentially would be affected. U.S. District Court Judge Brian Morris said the State Department's analysis fell short of a hard look and requires a supplemental environmental study. He ordered the State Department to consider the effects of current oil prices on the viability of the pipeline, the cumulative effects of greenhouse gas emissions from the Alberta Clipper expansion and the Keystone Pipeline, as well as updated modeling of potential oil spills and recommended mitigation measures, among other issues. That Alberta Clipper is another oil pipeline owned and operated by Enbridge that runs from Alberta to Superior, Wisconsin. In addition, the court required the State Department to consider potential adverse effects on endangered species from oil spills associated with Keystone, quoting here, in light of the updated data on oil spills and leaks. Coming your way next on Agriculture Today, this week's edition of Tree Tales. And standing by with that is K-State Forester Ryan Armbrust. Ryan? The warmth of summer has given way to the crisp air and brown leaves of fall here in Kansas. And in parts of the state, we've already seen some snow. However, one plant is noticeably still green and leafy across much of the state, a telling sign that it's not from around here. Asian bush honeysuckle, once planted in great numbers in the misguided but noble ambition to stabilize soil and provide habitat for birds, is now a despised and damaging invader in much of Kansas and surrounding states. Bush honeysuckle leafs out early and stays green late, one unfair advantage it has over our native vegetation that honeysuckle is actively displacing. It's very noticeable this time of year, a dark green layer around the edges of our woodlands and urban areas, with bright red berries borne along the stems in sometimes huge quantities. This large shrub finds a home almost anywhere within woodland edges, stream corridors, unmanaged waste areas, and along rights of way. Originally thought to provide a good food source for birds, We now understand that the berries of bush honeysuckle are more like junk food for birds, not providing the nutrition needed for migratory birds. The open branching structure also leads to higher predation of nests that birds make in these large shrubs, further threatening our native birds. Bush honeysuckle can be difficult to eradicate without a commitment to follow-up control. Spraying glyphosate in the spring is not very effective, as larger plants can grow out of the damage and off-target impacts from the herbicide can kill the remaining native plants that we're trying to help recover. Cutting stems and treating with herbicide is effective, but there can be thousands of stems per acre, making the labor unthinkable for controlling more than just a few square yards. Perhaps the best time to treat is in late fall, when the only thing green in the woods is bush honeysuckle. Non-selective glyphosate herbicide is very effective at this stage. While there is no silver bullet that allows for a one-and-done treatment, taking some steps now to manage this invasive plant will reduce future infestations and ensure a better future for our forests and woodlands across Kansas. I'm Ryan Armbrust, Forest Health and Conservation Forester with the Kansas Forest Service, and this has been another Tree Tale. All right, Ryan, many thanks. Coming up shortly after the break, this week's Kansas 4-H segment for you here on Agriculture Today. Legal and financial concerns surround the day-to-day management of the agricultural industry. Producers, ag creditors, and USDA agencies rely on Kansas Agricultural Mediation Services. If you've received an adverse decision from the USDA or have an ag credit concern, Call today, 800-321-3276, or visit us online, Kansas Agricultural Mediation Services, exploring options, generating solutions. This is Agriculture Today. I'm Jeff Wickman. The Kansas 4-H Dog Care and Training Action Team and Kansas 4-H Youth Development are sponsoring a Dog Judges Certification, Recertification, and Project Training January 25th through the 27th at the Hutchinson Kennel Club in South Hutchinson. Northwest Area 4-H Specialist Dara Waldron, who oversees the Dog Care and Training Programs, says this long-running training program better prepares judges and volunteer leaders on the standards of 4-H showmanship, agility, obedience, and rally obedience. So what we try to do is we try to certify new judges because we never have enough judges. 
It can also be for the recertification of those judges. And then we know a lot of people just want to increase their knowledge base about dogs, so we call it a, a big project leader training for general knowledge about the dog, too. So it's involving over three days with a lot of information and a lot of different things happening. Go into a little bit more detail. What are the type of things that they'll be learning about or getting certified or recertified in? Well, we hope that they will agree to be certified in all four of the disciplines in dog, which would be showmanship, obedience, rally obedience, and agility. But sometimes they choose to just get certified in one or two. And again, the the, um, dog judges' training is open for all of it, or they can pick and choose. So it's a kind of a cafeteria menu where they can pick and choose what they want to do. But we hope that they will come to all of it because we do need judges that can actually judge all four disciplines. And it starts off with just the kind of mechanics of the dog judging process on Friday evening. And then we get into the nuts and bolts on Saturday and on Sunday because it does go Friday night, all day Saturday and all day Sunday. And on Saturday, then they'll be doing showmanship and obedience. And on Sunday, we have rally obedience and agility. So they're being basically instructed on how to judge these different competitions? Yes. If you're doing the judge's certification, not only do you receive the lecture, everybody receives that, but then we involve those people wishing to be a judge or be recertified as a judge. They have to do a practicum where they have to actually go out and practice judging. So we have to have also dogs and 4-H's there or dog teams there where they can actually have good practice, and then they get critiqued on how well they judged using the score sheet. So it's a process of being able to see things in the ring and then being able to note those on the score sheet. And so that in itself is an art and takes practice and you get better with more practice. And and that's part of the training where they get scored not only on a written test, but also on the practicum of being able to judge and see what's happening out there in the ring. And as you mentioned, you're trying to get this to be a little bit more standardized across 4-H? Yes, that was the original intent. And we've been you know, we've been doing that for several years now. So there is some more consistency and we work, you know, with the questions and they ask about this and they have to compare it to AKC, American Kennel Club. And we explain that, you know, while they're a great program, 4-H is different and they're not the same programs. You would probably like to have as many judges as you can. And uh, is there a need in certain areas of the state for more judges? Yes, I'd say all over. We never have enough judges, and we're always trying to get as many as we can. So um, we could probably handle 30, 35 at this, and that'd be wonderful to have that many people participate. This year, we're fortunate that it's going to be in South Hutchinson at the Hutch Kennel Club, and they have a brand-new facility that's designed specifically for dog shows, dog programs, and we're going to be able to use that facility. So we're excited to be working with the Hutch Kennel Club and in this new facility. I'm assuming that you'd also like to have maybe people who are brand new to this. What type of a learning curve is it if you're brand new to this? If you've never done it, you know, and then you you might not want to be a judge right off, and you can always come back in a later year. But we do have lots of people who just want to gain more knowledge, and they will say, well, I just want to observe this year and and go through the project leader training, and then I'll I'll consider it for future years. And, And when they get started, you know, they can always change their mind and we'll swap them over to be in the judges where they do the the practicums and the tests that they want. So we try to be flexible, but we do encourage them to do it. And then, you know, they may say, I only want to do showmanship and obedience, and I'll worry about the other two disciplines, agility and rally obedience later. So we're, we're very flexible, and we try to fit it to what their needs are and what their desires are. There is the recertification aspect, so this is something that you're wanting someone who maybe hasn't been recertified in a while to participate in as well? Yes, we encourage them every five years or so to be recertified because a few things do change and we just try to refresh them and they get a chance to practice their judging skills again and they're critiqued by um, trainers that we have out there who are with them and observing them. So they judge what they see on the in the ring and then they're critiqued by our trainers who then say, well... This is what you should have hopefully have seen, and then they point out as to what they did or didn't see. And the hands-on training that they're going to get is probably what's most valuable? Yes, because, you know, you can, in theory, see how, what everything is and what the score sheet says, but for you to actually match it up when you're out there in a show ring watching a, a team, the 4-H member and the dog, perform doing whatever discipline it is and then being able to make uh, annotations on the score sheet, whether they didn't do it and it's a deduction of one point, one half point, whatever it is, and then tallying things up. And you have to be able to match that up, that skill, to be able to see it 
as it's happening. And it's tough because you look down and you miss something. But, you know, if you don't see it, you don't see it. And the dogs are provided there? We get volunteers. We'll get Reno County 4-H'ers to bring their dogs in, and they help us by providing the dog and the 4-H member to provide, I guess what you would call it, talent, so that we have a real case scenario where they're judging real animals and dogs and a dog team. So participants really only need to worry about their lodging, not their animals lodging. That is correct. You know, I guess they could bring their dog along, but it's really not designed for them to have to bring their dog because we have the dogs that we need provided for them. I haven't really talked about the cost, so if, I, if you want, I'll cover that briefly. Sure. The so full-time cost for Friday night, all day Saturday, all day Sunday is $95, and that's for both to be certified as a judge as well as being just an observer going through the project leader training. We do have some other options that if they only want Saturday only, which would be for showmanship and obedience, it's $55. And for Sunday only, for rally obedience and agility, that is also $55. And if they just want specific disciplines or phases, they're $35 each. So if they only wanted to come for, say, showmanship on Saturday and agility on Sunday, you know, it'd still be $70, $35 for each of those two. So there's a mix and match. They can pick what they want to do and let us know, but the most efficient and cost-effective would be the full-time at $95. And all of this information will be on the Kansas 4-H website, and also the registration deadline is not until January 15th, so they have quite a while to get things in line. Yeah, we're just about to get it all up on the website where they can click and register online. That's Northwest Area 4-H Specialist Daryl Waldron. Full details, including costs, is currently available at kansas4h.org. Online registration for the dog judges certification, recertification, and project training will go live later this week. Again, the registration deadline is January 15th. And that'll do it for this edition of Agriculture Today. For Eric Atkinson, I'm Jeff Wickman. This is the K-State Radio Network.